Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's presentation, Responses to Coronavirus in Different Countries. I'm Diane Fenner of the New York City Bar Association, and the co-sponsors of today's presentation are the Health Law Committee and the Senior Lawyers Committee. And you are welcome to join the City Bar. Membership is open to attorneys or affiliates, and you can visit our website, nycbar.org, for more information. We New Yorkers were among the first people in this country to be hit hard by coronavirus. And for a while, New York was the global epicenter of the pandemic until we succeeded in bringing the virus cases down to a more manageable level, as our governor likes to keep reminding us. But now that we have come this far, people in other states have started getting sick and dying, which obviously could have been prevented if they had taken a lesson from our book. But there's a much bigger story. The US was not the first country to face coronavirus. Other countries faced it and brought it under control. What could we have learned from them if we had chosen to follow their lead? Here's what we know for sure. America is a rich country with a respected medical system and 5% of the world's population, but we have 30% of the world's COVID deaths. Why did that happen? How did the US differ from other countries? What are the lessons to be learned? The changes we could still make. According to economics professor Richard D. Wolf, our speaker today, the problem is less the virus than the failed preparation for it and the inadequate response to it by both the private sector and the government. He will present his analysis and then answer questions from you, our audience. You can submit questions using the Q&A feature on your screen. If you look down at the bottom and a little bit to the right, you'll see that icon. Let me just introduce the discussion with a couple of statistics to put the problem into perspective. We'll compare the number of cases in the US with a place that's similar in size and in wealth, like the EU. The daily average of new cases per million people in the United States is 160. The daily average of new cases per million people in the European Union is nine. Arizona alone has more cases per day than the entire European Union. Now let's look at the number of deaths from the virus. A study out of Harvard University last month compared the COVID deaths in Germany, South Korea, Australia, Singapore, against COVID deaths in the US. What did they conclude? That between 70 to 99% of COVID death in the US could have been prevented if we had taken the same measures that those other countries did. When people are dying, not because of a disease, but because of a government policy, we as citizens have a duty to figure out what's going on. There have been plenty of theories. One theory was that the current occupant of the White House didn't want to close business because a bad economy would hurt chances of a reelection. The speaker we bring you today goes deeper than that in analyzing what's at work here. Professor Richard Wolf is an economist. He's looking at what happened through the lens of economic theory. He will explain how the root cause of this disaster goes beyond mere political expediency, beyond any one person or election, and why it is our fundamental system of economics that created this failure. Professor Wolf holds degrees from Harvard, Stanford, and Yale. He's the author of several books and articles on political economy. He was a member of the faculty at Yale University, City University of New York, and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, where he is a professor emeritus. He's been a visiting professor of economics at the Sorbonne in Paris, France, and is currently a visiting professor in the graduate program of international affairs at the New School University here in New York City. He's a frequent speaker at colleges and universities. He's been interviewed on radio and television by Bill Moyers, Bill Maher, and Fox Television's Stuart Varney, among others. 
He produces and hosts a weekly radio and TV show called Economic Update. And now I give you Emeritus Professor of Economics, Dr. Richard D. Wolf. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, uh, Diane. I hope it's okay if I call you by your first name now that we've known each other a little bit. Thank you to the New York City Bar Association for the invitation. I really am honored to be asked to speak to you and hope that I can in return uh, provide you with some insights uh, to chew over uh, and to think about as we all live through uh, what is already one of the greatest crises faced by the United States in our history. I don't mean to be dramatic, but I do believe that. We are in the middle of a combination a pandemic as bad as any the country has faced, at least since the so-called Spanish flu uh, back in uh, 1918, and at the same time, an economic crash of our capitalist system, uh, which began in February, a little bit before the pandemic hit us, either of those events would have been a strain on the system. Having the two together makes the word strain inadequate uh, to capture what's going on, and I think you'll see that uh, as I go through what I have to offer you today. Let me begin with uh, the statistic uh, that you heard in the introduction. The United States has a little under 5% of the world's population, and we have somewhere between 24 and 30% of the COVID cases and the COVID-19 deaths. We are one of the richest countries in the world. We have one of the most developed medical systems. We have a very good transportation, uh, communication system. What in the world is going on for us to have, and there's no nice way to put this, such a colossal failure? We are 5% of the people of the world, and we have a quarter or more of the fatalities and the illnesses with no end in sight. And as you were told in the introduction, many other countries and very different kinds of countries have performed much better. They are mostly much, much less, less wealthy than the United States, have less developed medical systems than the United States, at least in many dimensions. And yet, and I'm gonna mention a few of them just to give you a smattering, uh, they have either avoided, as in some cases such as Vietnam, any deaths at all, or their numbers are tiny. A little bit like that comparison between all of the EU and Arizona alone that you heard a few minutes ago. So on the socialist side, Vietnam, Cuba, China, they did really well. They prepared for this illness, and they have contained the illness. On the non-socialist side, New Zealand, South Korea, Taiwan, they also did very well in preparing for and containing this virus. What in the world is going on if countries as different as those, and there are many more I could have picked, were able to perform so much better than we did here in the United States and so much better than we are now doing here in the United States. Much of the rest of my talk is an attempt to explain how and why this happened. And to begin, I will not spend much time criticizing a uh, President Trump. That's not because he doesn't deserve it, but because plenty of folks are doing that, and this problem predates and is deeper than anything you could attribute uh, to him. Uh, he didn't help the situation, he isn't helping it now, but I think the explanation has to go beyond uh, the level of uh, electoral politics, uh, even if that's the level at which the media so often handles it. Okay, so let's begin. In economics, we describe the United States as a mixture of a private sector, which is the largest part of our economy, and a public sector, a government that has all kinds of 
ways of shaping and influencing the performance of the private sector. Even though the private sector is the dominant one, the big one, uh, the government has always in our society played a very prominent economic role. Uh, I know some of you are uh, invested in and aware of the endless debate about the government should or shouldn't do much or little. Most of that debate is very strange since the reality has always been that the government is a major shaper and player in our economy. But I'm going to start with the largest segment, the private sector. And here's where the economics becomes crucial. Think about it this way. We have in the United States enterprises that are perfectly capable of producing ventilators, masks, gloves, testing equipment, ICU units in a hospital, beds, anything and everything needed to prepare for a pandemic, for a virus, is material we can produce. But we did not. Why not? And the answer is the way our economic system works. Companies that would make a ventilator, a mask, a glove, or anything else are profit-driven enterprises in our private sector. They are not going to produce a mask or a glove or a ventilator or anything else, store it for an indefinite period of time in a warehouse, or to be more accurate, stockpile it in warehouses across the country where our population is located, so as to have it available to sell if and when the virus comes. The reason is it's too risky. The profit is too small and too uncertain. There are simply less risky, more profitable alternatives, which is why those companies chose those alternatives, because that's what their executives are paid to do. That's how we reward successful investing in a capitalist system. All of those people were doing what the system rewards them for doing, and they avoided doing what the system might have punished them for doing had they lost money on producing all those things. So they didn't do it, and we weren't prepared. There is no way out of that analytic. So now the question becomes, what now happens? What's the next step in this thinking this through? And the answer is pretty obvious. The government, the government could have come in and said to the American people what I've just said to you, namely, our private capitalist system is not set up to undertake the kinds of investments, the kinds of production, the kinds of stockpiling of output that is necessary to combat a virus. Parenthetically, let me remind you all, there is nothing new about a virus. Uh, back in 1918, we had something called the Spanish flu. By the way, the word Spanish it had nothing to do with where the flu originated. It originated in Kansas, here in the United States. It killed millions of people, including roughly 700,000 Americans. A terrible scourge on the world. We know about those things because we suffered them. In recent years, there have been dozens of viruses. There's a whole class of epidemiologists who study these viruses, how they're formed, how they spread. Nothing about this is particularly new. The specifics of each virus are unique, but the general pattern, well known. So again, no excuse. There's nothing about this that we shouldn't have been prepared for, but our private system doesn't do it. So the government could have come in and said, look, that's the way our private capitalist system works. It rewards investments and production that happen not to be very good for public health, which you would think is one of the first requirements of any economic system, but that's for another discussion. So the government didn't do what it could have done. 
And here is what it could have done. It could have come to the ventilator producers or the glove or the, the mask producers and said, okay, we understand how the private profit system works. So here's what we'll do. As fast as you produce the gloves, the masks, the ventilators, we, the government, will buy them from you. We remove thereby all risk. As fast as you produce them, we will buy them. We will stockpile them around the country. We will pay for the storage of them. We will pay for monitoring them. We will pay for replacing them if they uh, wear out or something happens to them. We'll take all that off your plate. Not only that, we'll pay you a pretty penny for the goods you produce that we take out of your uh, production line as fast as you produce them. Under those circumstances, those companies would have produced all that we needed to be prepared for this virus. Not only could that have happened, but we are already as a society doing that. And that might be the most stunning thing I have to tell you today. Here's the example of the government doing exactly what I just said. We call it the military industrial complex, or if you like, the defense system of the United States. Because it turns out that it isn't privately profitable for a company to make a missile and store it in a, a warehouse somewhere, or a gun, or a ship, or a plane, or a you fill in the blank. It's exactly the same economic problem. It's too risky. You're going to store it for how long? Till the next war happens? Who knows whether that will happen or when it will happen or where it will happen or how it will be fought. Too many risks, too long a horizon. It's just not profitable compared to other options all of these companies have. The United States government figured that out a long time ago. So here's what the government does. It goes to the missile producer, the gun producer, the ship producer, and it says, I'm the Navy, I'm the Army, I'm the Air Force, whatever. I will buy these things from you as fast as you produce them. I will pay you, we call those cost plus con uh, contracts, I will pay you an amount of money for that missile or that gun or, or that ship that not only replenishes your costs, but gives you a healthy profit on top of it at zero risk. All of it will be done in advance. Then the government is prepared for a military eventuality. Whether it's defensive or offensive, I will leave to your judgment. But the government is militarily prepared and it knew how to do that. It could have, and it should have, done exactly the same for the, the, the mili excuse me, the health care of our country, the medical system, the same as it did for the defense, but it didn't. In other countries, many of those that I've mentioned, that's exactly what the government did. Since in most of those countries, whether they call themselves socialist or not, it's mostly private enterprises that were involved. And the government went to them and said, we must be prepared, so we will buy from you, et cetera, et cetera. They did what we did not do in the United States. Okay, let's then explain, or try to, why here in the United States, the government did not do in the medical field what other countries did, and did not do in the medical field what it did in its own military uh, materials field. And the answer here is a profound economic ideology that governs most of the United States, most of both of our major parties, most of the media, etc. And this ideology goes something like this. Private enterprise is the best thing. Private enterprise is efficient. Private enterprise is well run. Private enterprise should be the dominant 
deferred to way of organizing the production of goods and services. You should not have the government involved, or if it is involved, it should be involved in a minimal way. I'm sure some of you know that in the history of economics, this was once called by the, in England, by a French name, laissez-faire, let it be in French, let the, go the, the government keep out of things, the private sector is best. And so we have in the United States a kind of principle of deference to the private sector. The government didn't want to be in the position of coming in and saying, gee, private capitalism is, happens to be set up in such a way that it's really crappy for public health. And that's the truth. We weren't prepared as the statistics are such dramatic evidence. It's not a system that's good on public health. By the way, is that a severe criticism of capitalism? You bet. But of course, that's hard here in the United States where criticisms of capitalism are so frightening to people that they're getting anywhere near there is a little bit like a child touching the proverbial hot stove. But there really is now no time for these niceties because we have a major crisis on our hands and we are desperately suffering sickness and death because the government did not step in, say honestly to the private sector, you're not set up to do this very well and we're gonna have to do in the medical field what we have always done in the military and defense field. That proved to be impossible. And by the way, not just for Mr. Trump, but for the Republican Party in general and for most of the Democratic Party as well. And even the critics were hesitant to go in and ask and answer the question, how did the private sector manage to do it so badly and why did the government um, not step in? All right, let me take it now to the next question. For me, the next question is, is the trauma that we are going through, and I want to underscore to you all, as an economist, we are going through an economic trauma. I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a doctor, but from everything I can tell, we are also going through a physical and mental health trauma, given our anxieties, given that we've moved our residences, our workplaces, that the uncertainty of all of this must eat at all of us one way or another. This is a major uh, kind of trauma. I want to underscore it because I think it helps illuminate something that is crucial for us to understand. We are going through an economic crash. We are having levels of unemployment that we have not seen as a nation since the Great Depression of the 1930s. There's actually a difference between the depression we're in now and that one. This one came upon us faster. We have never before had 50 million, let me repeat it, 50 million people apply for unemployment insurance in a matter of 15 to 16 weeks. It took much longer, it was a much slower accommodation to the depression that was imposed on the people back in 1929, 30, and 31, and two. So we are traumatized by the extent of this collapse and by the speed of this collapse. It means we have to take extreme measures, just like the pandemic requires us to take extreme measures. And the normal procedures of what we are doing and what we have done in the past will not suffice. And yet I'm afraid I have to tell you that the leading policymakers in this country, again on both sides of the two party system we have here, in the main, not 100%, but in the main, they don't seem to understand the extent of this crisis, which they believe, I suspect, will go away soon, the way our president promises that it will. 
despite the fact that it isn't and that nothing in economic history uh, teaches us that it will. To drive the point home yet one more way before I conclude, much of the economic history of the United States after the Great Depression of the 1930s was shaped in profound ways by the Depression. It was the defining activity event of the 20th century. Everything that happened in America, economically speaking, after 1945, with the end of the war that came right after the Great Depression, was shaped by that depression. In many ways, the last 50, 60 years have been the undoing of the New Deal, the rolling back of what was done in the depths of that depression. And that's one of the reasons we are as poorly prepared for this one as we have shown ourselves to be, because we were still in the process of undoing the New Deal when we were confronted with the very kind of collapse that forced the New Deal on us. To give you just one example, in the depths of the New Deal, the government at that time, President Franklin Roosevelt, undertook under pressure of masses of people from below, undertook a number of daring reforms. He created the social security system. We had never had that in the United States before. Suddenly, at a time when the government had no money because of the depression, nobody paying taxes, etc., at a time when the government has no money, it agrees to give everybody who's 65 years of age or older a check for the rest of their life every month. No sooner was that agreed than federal unemployment compensation. Tens of millions of people out of work were going to give them a check every week for a year or two to help them out. The first minimum wage passed at that time. And this is the one I want you to focus on. A federal jobs program. That's right. The government stepped in unprecedented and said that people who had been fired from the private employment that they had enjoyed before would now be rehired by the government. Nobody else would hire them. The government would. And it did. 15 million Americans stopped being unemployed, got a job, got an income, were able to stay in their homes, pay their mortgages, all the rest. The most stunning thing for me as an economist, looking at a equal or worse depression now, is not only that we have no government hiring at all, even though it worked fantastically, back in the 1930s. But we don't even discuss it. We don't have a national conversation about the choice we're making, having millions of people unemployed, rather than paying them, not all that much more than they're already getting, for doing all kinds of socially useful things. Let me remind you that during the 1930s, unemployed people built those national parks that we all enjoy uh, visiting in the western part of the United States. They did some of the first ecological reclamation that this country has done. None of that is being done, and the economic crisis is therefore getting worse as well. You may not know, let me tell you. A third of all commercial tenants in the United States did not pay their rent to their landlord for their store, uh, for their facility in a mall, and so on. Roughly the same percentage of residential tenants have not paid their landlord. Because of that, the landlords turned around and have told the banks from whom they borrowed the money to establish these institutions that they can't repay their loans. And that has forced the banks to tell the Federal Reserve that they may not be viable if this problem isn't solved. But no one knows how to solve this problem. Everybody is gearing up with, if you pardon me, lawyers to fight this battle out. And no one knows where that's going to go. Many states have a moratorium on rent and mortgage payments. It runs out at the end of July or August. 
Are we going to have 20 million evictions? If so, we're talking about social disintegration on a scale neither you nor I have ever experienced and probably neither you or I want to be near, let alone in the middle of what is going on. All right, let me conclude. We live in an economic system that has strengths and weaknesses, like all systems do. But we also live in a system that has a history, like all systems do. And to be very schematic, that history has three stages. Birth, evolution over time, and death. Slavery was born, evolved over time, and died. Feudalism was born and evolved over time and died. Capitalism was born, we know that. It's evolved over time, we know that too. And unfortunately, that leaves the last stage, which hasn't happened yet. Is it happening now? I never thought I would ask that question. I did not expect to see anything in my lifetime of the sort that we are living through so I excuse myself, maybe I should have asked such a question. None of my professors in all the exalted universities I ever studied at, they never asked a question either. But we are asking it now. The problem of our economic system is in fact a whole network of problems. And we have been, as a nation, very poor at facing those problems, at interrogating those problems, and exploring the alternative ways available to us to try to solve those problems. And we did it for an ideological reason. It is the legacy of the Cold War. To be a critic of capitalism at, in those years, and I'm talking here the 50s, all the way through to the present, depending on where you are in the country, it's stronger or weaker. But we have lived with a notion that to be critical of capitalism is somehow to be un-American, disloyal, ignorant, or evil, or some combination of all of those things, but something to stay away from. So the hard questions about our problems, they didn't get asked. As some of our more acute politicians have told us, we have a tendency to kick problems down the road. Well, the problem with doing that is you run the risk of being where we are today. We are stuck with problems that we kick down the road and that are blowing up all around us. We didn't handle the climate change issue and that's part of why we have these viruses. We didn't learn as many had told us, by the way, Republicans and Democrats alike, you have to prepare the world for viruses. We know it from SARS, Ebola, MERS. I mean, they happen all the time. There is no mystery here. You have to be prepared. And it wasn't just Mr. Trump dissolving the commission. It was that the work done by Bush and by Obama wasn't that great either. And it was that the whole thing would somehow not really be a problem that the government would have to take care of because the private sector, you know, is the way to get things done. You know, it isn't. It never was. And that's an ideological hangover from the Cold War that we need now, I think, to outgrow. It's long overdue. But we have other problems. And I want to conclude by making sure they're mentioned so that the kicking down the road and the postponement doesn't keep going because now, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot afford it. We are at a point in our society that is very, very serious. If nothing else, let me get that across. We have a problem, for example, of instability. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but every four to seven years on average, Capitalist economic systems crash. We have lots of words for this. Economic downturn, recession, depression, bust, crisis, crash, and so on. That's because we have them all the time. We have them every four to seven years, and so has every other country 
into which capitalism, the system of employer-employee organization of production, that's what capitalism means, wherever that has occurred, ever since it started back in England in the 18th century and spread all over the world every four to seven years. Look, the United States is the best example. Here we are 20 years into the 21st century. We had the so-called dot-com crisis in the spring of 2000. We had the so-called subprime mortgage crisis in the autumn of 2008. And here we are with the COVID-19 crisis in 2020. 20 years, three crises, you got it, six to seven year average. That's what it is. And we have to do something about that because it is extremely dangerous in a society to have built in this kind of instability. Slavery and feudalism, with all their weaknesses, did not have this kind of instability built into them. And we now are living through the awful implications of having a viral pandemic and a capitalist crash at the same time. Last of the major problems of our system, inequality. I mean, we are now living with a level of economic inequality that is just this side of insane. I will give you just one or two examples, but they will come back to haunt us all. Over the last 16 weeks, when 52 million Americans suffered the loss of a job and had to go file for unemployment insurance, since it takes a while to get your unemployment check, even if you get the extra $600, you're in economic difficulty. But that's nothing compared to the fact that the following questions have no answer for you. Will the job be there when you're done? When the unemployment is over, can you get that job back? If you do, will it pay you the same amount of money? Will it have the same benefits? Will it be the same hours? You don't know the answer to any of those questions. So your loss of income is complicated by a level of uncertainty that would drive anybody right to the edge. But over the same period of time that 52 million people lost their jobs, many, many of our employers were having a hard time because of the collapse of shopping, because of the collapse of you can't go to a restaurant. You all know that. Well, those employers are now going to do what employers always do in great crashes. They become aware that unemployment for their workers is an opportunity for them. They can go to the worker and they can say, look, John or Mary, I'm really sorry, but I'm having a hard time. So I'm gonna have to ask you to take a 10% cut in your wages. I'm gonna have to ask you to suspend my, uh, my contribution to your retirement fund. I'm gonna to have to ask you to come in 20 minutes earlier with no change uh, other than the cut in your pay, et cetera. Why? Because the employer knows you, can, you have to accept it. Otherwise, you will be replaced by one of the millions of unemployed who are desperate for work. The latest reports from the Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics, which keeps track of these things in Washington, is already wages are starting to go down, paid wages. So you can see already. So the employed person is under the gun and the unemployed person is under the gun. And then they pick up the newspaper and they are told the stock market is roaring. And that Jeffrey Bezos of Amazon, just to pick one person, has seen the value of his portfolio go up by 20 billion, with a B, over the same 15 weeks that 52 million of his fellow citizens uh, found their economic survival under attack. We live in a country that in the entire 20th century justified capitalism on the grounds that it creates and sustains a vast middle class. Over the last 20 years, and now at a breakneck pace, it is destroying that middle class and shoving most of them into the lower class. 
This is a country that didn't prepare its people for this, that hasn't expected this. We live in a country where people used to imagine that every generation lives better than the one before, that that's somehow built in to American exceptionalism. All of that is being undone. To put together a society assaulted by a pandemic of this magnitude, together with an economic crash of this magnitude, when you have kicked down the roads, the problems of lack of preparedness for the virus, instability of your system, and inequality of an extreme sort, then you're asking a system to survive when you have made the conditions of that survival virtually impossible. And that itself becomes a terrifying glimpse that people will increasingly have into what may be their future. I take no satisfaction or pleasure, believe me, in presenting this imagery to you or in telling you these things. But I'm assuming from what uh, Diane told me about your interests that you would want something straight, unvarnished, and honest so we can try to figure a way out of this dilemma rather than engage in more kicking down the road, which is simply too dangerous, if not for you and me, then for the children that have to come after us. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be glad to respond to comments or questions of any kind about anything I've said. All right, well, we have some questions that have come in. Uh, the first four, I'm gonna start with um, Brian McGovern. Why wouldn't the government have followed the model of the military industrial complex and paid cost plus for PPE? The private sector of supply manufacturers would have profited uh, as have the defense contractors. Why is public health security treated any differently from national military security? And how does the capitalist system and incentives explain that difference? Good question, one that comes fairly often. Here's the best answer that I've been able uh, to come up with. We actually have not just the military industrial complex, we have, as I think the questioner understands, a medical industrial complex. We have four industries that work together to operate a monopoly in this country. They are the doctors, the hospitals, the medical uh, drug and device makers, and fourth and finally, the medical insurance industry. Those four industries have gotten together. This has happened in the history of capitalism uh, many times. They have gotten together to operate a monopoly. That is, they help each other. Each one agrees to support the ability of the other one to overcharge, to restrict supply, and all the rest, the normal things that monopolies do. Uh, that has been successful for them. It explains why, if you like, take a look at the uh, uh, medical industry of the United States and you compare it, for example, to Western Europe, you will discover that the United States, here in the United States, we pay way more for our medical care adding up all the different expenses uh, than any of those countries do. And we're not even close. And the record of our medical performance is mediocre. We don't have the longevity that many of those countries do. We stay in hospitals on average longer number of days per year than they do. Uh, we're not the worst, but we're nowhere near the best, but we pay the most. And again, that's very typical of a monopoly. Why am I telling you this? because that's the reason that the government was not called in. They don't want the government to come in and become a major player. That's why they haven't wanted the government to buy, as in many countries, the government comes in, buys, for example, drugs in bulk and turns around and resells them to the public and at a much lower price because they're buying in bulk, they can get a lower price. We don't allow that here and that's the history of a, of a medical monopoly that fears that the more the government is involved in medical care, the more the demand will arise that the government bust the monopoly in the medical field the way it did, for example, among the telephone companies when we broke up AT&T 
or among the oil or petroleum companies uh, earlier when that was done. So they've wanted to keep the government out of the hole. Every time the government steps in, the scream socialist medicine or socialized medicine goes up because their instinct is to keep that away, which is one of the reasons they were so opposed to Obamacare and all the rest of it until they could make sure that they carved out a safe way for that monopoly to be maintained. Um, we have several questions around that theme. Um, Trudy has asked about why the public health should not be um, in the public sector. In other words, not subject to any private sector control. And um, I'm going to ask whether you feel you've adequately addressed that by talking about the concept of monopoly. Sure. Um, look, around the world, most medical care systems are mixtures. Uh, in most cases, the government plays a significantly larger role than it plays here. But it is also true that in many of the systems around the world, there's all kinds of mixtures, if you like, between state control, state operation of activity, and private sector type of enterprises, private sector type of services. Uh, my guess is if we weren't living in the legacy of the Cold War and the, and, the, and the taboo on criticizing capitalism, we would have long ago uh, opted for something like uh, either the British system or the Canadian system or the French system uh, and make a mixture basically uh, between the public and the private trying to figure out, which would be logical, what's the best combination? How do you get the best quantity and quality of medical care at the lowest possible price? I mean, that's what we teach our students in economics departments around the country. You ought to ask that question always and be open to criticize the status quo if it were to appear that you're not getting the best quality and quantity of product for the price you pay. Since it is crystal clear that the rest of the world gets equivalent or uh, the rest of the developed world, industrial developed world, gets better equivalent or better care while paying much, much less, the prima facie situation is one that should have an intensive debate, but we haven't had that in this country. Even now that you have a movement uh, because of Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and others that puts single payer or Medicare for all forward, you're now having much later than in other countries, a debate that was settled in other countries. And by the way, the medical profession is quite afraid and, and justifiably because it is politically impossible. Uh, I'm a student of European economics and politics uh, for many reasons, I've studied it. In Europe, you cannot attack the public support of healthcare. It be, it's a political uh, impossibility. It's, it, it's literally the opposite of what it is here. Uh, with all their problems, and they have plenty of problems, their public supported health provides people with a healthcare at a price that the mass of people would rally to defend if any politician dared mess with it, it, it's really different from the United States. Let me, if I take another moment, because I can make a link between that, good question, and what I was saying before. I'm gonna take the strongest economy in Europe, which is Germany. In Germany, at the beginning of the pandemic, mid-March of this year, unemployment was 5% roughly what it was in this country. That's a little bit lower in this country, four and a half, something like that percent. It is now 17, 18, depending on how you count, percent. It has gone wildly up, as you all know. Here's something you may not know. Germany's unemployment today is 6% compared to what it was 16 weeks ago when it was 5%. In other words, Germany did not allow and that's the word that's key here, the verb, allow mass unemployment, which the United States did. And the reason is clear. The government in Germany is a conservative, 
pro-capitalist government. Angela Merkel is a conservative politician. She heads the Christian Democratic Union, which is a conservative political party and has been for the last 75 years. So she's a conservative, not a socialist, not a progressive of any kind. But she understands, like all European leaders do, you cannot do there what you can do in the United States. If she had dared to have tens of millions of people, or an equivalent for Germany of what we had here, become unemployed, those people would have been in the street by the next morning, and Angela Merkel would have seen her government crash. It's not doable. You can't do it. But you can do it here. And it's the same with the medical. The things you can do here, you can't do anywhere else because of the different mentality that has evolved over the last 75 years. You know, we don't have in the United States a socialist party worthy of the name. We used to, but we don't anymore. We used to have two big ones. We don't have any now. We used to have an important communist party. We don't have any, I mean, it exists, but it has no influence. That's not true in European countries. They all have big socialist parties, powerful labor unions, big communist or anti-capitalist parties. And that shapes the discourse in the society. Things that are unthinkable there, we are comfortable with and vice versa. And that has to do with their different evolution out of the Great Depression in the 20th century compared to ours. And we are now living the consequences of those differences. I'm going to try and combine a couple of points. Um, uh, Adrian uh, and Barry have both raised the same question, and I want to tie it into your comments. Uh, Adrian says, let's imagine we might have a functioning government that wants to do the right thing. What has to be done to fix the health crisis and the economy simultaneously? And Barry says, if we lawyers just gave you a magic wand, what policies would you propose and enact now? I just want to tie that back in with some of your comments. Um, you talked about um, feudalism giving way to capitalism, and uh, we all know that that was done through a violent revolution. Um, you have talked about the taboo around criticism of capitalism, but uh, it is true that Bernie Sanders, as you mentioned, um, developed quite a following under the banner of socialism. And I, my question now is, where do you look to for the best chance at hope? Do you see it as being relegated to only coming from a violent revolution? Have you looked at the Sanders-Biden plan from the economic side? And um, what do you think we could do or should do at this point in order to bring about some change? Okay, a part of me wants to give a facetious answer. I, I won't do that, but I, I wanna tell you what I would have said if I did give you a facetious answer, which is if you handed me that famous magic wand, uh, then to paraphrase one of my former professors, I would hand it back to you because it is such a difficult proposition that you're asking me to respond to. So let me try with a couple of specifics that might happen uh, one day. We have millions of people that are unemployed. And we have a population, roughly 325 million here in the United States, of whom maybe 40 million have been tested. Okay, I have a proposition. The federal government should hire millions of unemployed and put them immediately to work testing the rest of the population. Because if we don't test, we don't know where the disease is, we don't know what kind of people are the ones that are most likely to get it, what kinds of folks in what kinds of situation are transmitting it, infecting others. All of the crucial questions, like any scientist knows, has to begin with gathering the most important facts that have to be understood. Those people need work that are unemployed. This is a socially useful task that we can have them do that makes them feel good about their contribution, 
makes them help their fellow citizens, and solves a problem that is part of why we have done so poorly because of the testing uh, craziness or the non-testing uh, that we have done. Let me give you a second example. I'm a professor. I am now teaching my classes at a distance. Distance learning, okay? In the interest of time, let me be very honest with you. That stinks. We don't do a very good job of distance learning. Whatever the process of education is, and it's very mysterious, and I've done it all my life, it's very complicated what goes on in a classroom. It has to do with your facial expressions, your body uh, language, your verbs, your, your adjectives, uh, the back and forth that students have with you, with one another. All of that is being scrambled. Much of that is no longer available. The alienation of the students is palpable. They don't understand what's happening. They don't understand why they have to pay a, this amount of money for something that is so obviously less effective. And it's even worse when you get to K-12. Well, we ought to have handled that problem. Okay, we have millions of people all unemployed. Many of them can teach all kinds of things that they know. Let's get them together with one other student, two, maybe three. Let's have a mass program of distancing, social distance learning two, three people in a room or on an outside, outdoor location so that the process of real education, even under limited conditions, can go forward. Let's give work to all the unemployed teachers and let's give work to all the people who could be a teacher under these special circumstances. Look, we have a national emergency. These are the kinds of things you do in a national emergency and they could make a real difference for people. We know from countless studies that if you're unemployed, it damages your self-esteem, it damages your self-confidence, it loses your connections to your employers and your fellow workers. It often also deteriorates your skill level. We are paying heavy price for this absurd luxury of unemployment that the Germans did not allow, and the French didn't, and even the British didn't on the scale that we did. So one of the first things I would do is take a page from the United States, the 1930s, when we did exactly that, and let's go to work. We don't have to wait on a Green New Deal. The very phrase Green New Deal is obviously taken from the original New Deal of the 1930s, plastering the word green in front of it. I have no objection, but this kind of work of improving our infrastructure, of helping us with our ecological problems, that's what the unemployed can do. And that's what they ought to be hired to do. And the government should be doing that. One of the most creative things ever done in the United States, I would do again. It was called the WPA. If you're not familiar with it, look it up. I think you'll find it amazing. In the 1930s, the United States government, as an official policy, invited all artists of all kinds who were unemployed to come and present themselves. Painters, sculptors, actors, poets, singers, you name it. And they were put together in troops by the federal government, which sent them all over the United States with particular emphasis on small cities, towns, and villages where people had never had a dance troupe or a poetry reading or uh, learning how to craft pottery or whatever it was. And it was one of the most creative, imaginable programs. It gave work to an army of artists and it brought real cultural hands-on experience to millions of Americans who had no other way of accessing that kind of cultural activity. It was a win-win, if you like me to use the colloquial. And it's the kind of thing that Americans figured out how to do then. I haven't the slightest doubt that Americans can figure out how to do that now. And the only question again is, why not? Why would you have a society throwing away 16 weeks of people's creative work, making them unemployed, filled with anxiety about it, when you didn't have to. That's when you know the ideology of a society is becoming fun fundamentally dysfunctional. 
the hostility, the anxiety of giving the government a role when the private sector either can't or won't, that's a process called shooting yourself in the foot. And the suffering from that and the long-term damage is enormous. All right, I think that uh, we're going to have to leave it there. It's now five o'clock. And I just want to thank you on behalf of the New York City Bar for your time and for sharing with us all of the um, information that you've shared. And um, I'll mention that there are other programs that are coming up on the New York City Bar uh, calendar. You can all find if you go to the website. And I think people can also find you on Economic Update. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Again, I appreciate the invitation. I hope you found it of interest. Uh, and maybe someday we can do it all again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.